As many of you know, our church has been in the process of revising and editing our doctrinal statement. And uh, at the beginning of this year, we started preaching through that doctrine statement. And about a month ago, we actually started talking about the doctrine of the Bible. Uh, Pastor Greg talked about what it means that our Bible is inspired. And some of you actually may have felt like that we've taken a little deviation from that the last couple of weeks as we've talked about how the Bible intersects uh, with some of our current issues and how we deal with each other relationally. And maybe technically that was a deviation, but it very much fit in with uh, this part of our doctrine statement because we believe that the Bible does influence us in how we should live and how we should respond to these different times. So we're actually going to continue with that thought and with that idea of, of the doctrine of the Bible today uh, a little bit further. But it is true that we are living in some challenging times. Uh, four months ago, none of us would have predicted how different our world would be today. So whether it's our COVID-19 challenges and social distancing and everything being canceled, um, and we just had our, our first baseball practice and first couple games just this week um, uh, for my kids. But everything is just different. Uh, whether it's COVID or whether it's our political upheaval and things going on in the Supreme Court or whether it's the racial tensions that are going on in our country right now that seem to be elevated at levels that I've never seen in my lifetime, it really does seem like we're, it's impossible for us to have any kind of real civil discourse. I mean, we're tearing down statues not just of racist men but of our founding fathers and Abraham Lincoln and other things. And and, and I don't bring that up to be political in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but just to point out the fact that this is a different world in which we live in. And somehow it seems that the church itself seems impotent to speak into these issues. Because one, we're, either we've been silent at best, or we've been complicit at worst when it comes to confronting the issues that we're facing. Or we've lived complacent and inconsistent Christian lives, and thus our input hardly seems worth listening to. Or the world has judged our biblical truths as being outdated and irrelevant. I came across this article earlier this month, June 12th actually, and the headline reads this. Bibles pulled from shelves for outdated idea that all humans are of one race, and made in the image of God. And I would read the article to you. It's actually fairly short. But that article would be funny. Actually, it's from a satirical website called the Babylon Bee. Um, and if you ever see anything on Facebook from the Babylon Bee. And you comment on it as if it was serious. You need to have your social media account removed. But the Babylon Bee is satirical. And it is just talking about how in these times... We are probably just one step away from people pulling the Bibles from store shelves because they view it as being outdated. And it would be funny if we weren't so close uh, to that reality probably happening someday soon. Um, but we as Christians, and it's true of millions of Christians around the world, but especially here at EBC, we believe that the Bible is true. It's God's inerrant and infallible word to mankind. And it is still relevant to our life today. If we would only study it and allow it to shape our life, we would see that God's word does have the answers to dealing with racism and financial uncertainty and social unrest and every other issue that we're facing today. And so that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about the Bible, God's Word, and specifically the canon of Scripture. Or what is our Bible, how did we get it, and how and why do we affirm that it is truly God's Word? So before I jump into it, let's just pray together, and then we'll look at these things. Father, we come before you now 
grateful that you have given us your word, which we believe is your communication to us. Yet I recognize that many of us um, really don't know what to believe about the Bible or how it influences us or even how we got your word. And so those truths do help shape our thinking and our behavior in so many different areas. And so, God, I pray that you will just teach us today and that you will allow us to see things in a new way uh, so that when we do open your word, we will truly see it for what it is. Your words to us. So, God, we're grateful for this time. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, in your notes, you'll find our proposed statement on what we at EBC believe about the Bible. And I hope you have your notes. Uh, check your email, download it, print it off, and, and, and have it there in front of you. But this is what, in our uh, revised doctrinal statement, this is what we're putting forth. We at EBC believe the Bible... The 66 books of the Old and New Testament is the inspired word of God. Because it is God's word and God cannot lie, every word in the original writings is absolutely truthful, accurate, and without error. It is God's unified narrative containing a clear and complete revelation of his will for salvation and the final authority on what we believe and how we should live. So acceptance of the Bible as the infallible written word of God requires prior historical conclusions as to which books make up Scripture. Some branches of the Christian church, for example, Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, include more than 66 books in the canon. Some modern sects, like Mormonism or Christian science, claim extra-biblical revelation. Muslims believe that God reveals, revealed the Quran to Muhammad from heaven, word for word. So the question of canonization, or how we inherited the precise contents of the Bible, becomes a vital one for Christians in their faith and practice. So you pull out your notes... The first point in there is, what is the canon of Scripture? And so here's just a simple definition. The word canon is used to describe the inspired books. It means the rule or a measuring stick. So the word canon signifies the standard by which books were measured to determine whether or not they were truly inspired. It's important to keep in mind that religious councils never had any power to cause books to be inspired. Rather, they simply recognized that that which God had inspired at the time when those books were written. So it has been said, the Bible is not an authorized collection of books, but a collection of authorized books. In other words... Men did not choose the best or their favorite writings and then label them as scripture or as holy scripture. Men simply compiled the writings and books that they already believed and knew to be scripture and collected them into one book, the Bible. But it's important to sort of ask this question why do you believe the Bible? Is it because it's old? Well, there are older books. Is it because it contains truth? There are other books that contain truth. So the question is, why do you believe it? Why do we believe the Bible? And what I want to propose to you today are um, several things that will help us understand how 
and why we believe that the Bible is true and worthy for us to, to, to take it as true. Well, the second point in your notes is composition. What books are in the Bible? So our English transi- translation these 66, has 66 books in it. There are 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. The books of the Old Testament are the prior product of at least 30 different authors and written over a period of at least a thousand years. It contains different genres like historical narratives, law, poetry, philosophy, and prophecy. The Old Testament is broken up into three parts. The law, which consists of the first five books, also known as the Pentateuch, which means the five roles. The second part is the prophets, which is made up of judges, Samuel, kings, the minor prophets, and most of the major prophets. And the third part of the Old Testament is called the writings, also known as the wisdom writings or the psalms. And that's made up of psalms and proverbs and the remaining books of the, of the Old Testament, including Daniel, um, The Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew, with a few select portions written in Aramaic. And when Alexander the Great conquered the ancient world, Greek became the common language throughout the world. In the 4th century BC, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek. And that's called the Septuagint. And that would be the Bible that Jesus read. So there's the 39 books of the Old Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament. That's the work of eight or nine different authors covering a span of only about 50 years. And it too has three parts. There's history, which is made up of the first five books as well, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. The second part of the New Testament is doctrine, and that, those are the epistle letters. And the third part is the prophecy, or revelation. Now, we don't include the Apocrypha as a part of our canon, uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we have the definition and the composition, but we want to look at why do these books, why do these 66 books come Why did they come into the canon of Scripture? So it was not the decision of the people that caused the canonicity, but the canonicity that caused their acceptance by the people. And I want to give you a few things here um, that I think is important for us to keep in mind uh, that help us understand why these books are the ones that we say are authoritative or are part of the canon of scripture. The first one is authoritative authors. Certain books came from men who were divinely inspired to reveal and convey God's will. There were the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New Testament. And so the question was, was the human author a spokesman for God? Was he a prophet or an apostle? Or did he have the prophetic gift? For example, Moses was recognized as writing under the authority of God. So the criteria for acknowledging the Pentateuch as part of the canon was whether or not those books came from God's servant Moses. Same with Joshua and his books. After Moses... God raised up the office of the prophets to continue revealing himself to the people. And the prophets to whom God spoke were recognized communicators of God's will. And their writings were regarded immediately as authoritative. So I want to to throw out just a, a quick, albeit a very weak analogy. But if you were going to write a history of Ohio State football, 
it would be immediately recognized that somebody like Woody Hayes would be an authoritative person to speak on that issue because of who he was and the authority he had, the reputation that he had as a representative of Ohio State football. Like I said, that's, I, know, I recognize that that's a weak analogy, but in the same way, when people looked at the authors because of their reputation or because they knew that they spoke on behalf of God because God was speaking to them, that their writings were immediately accepted as authoritative just because of who the author was. So that's the first one, authoritative authors. The second one is acceptance by God's people. So as people recognize the authority of certain people as being spokesmen for God, they naturally accepted those writings as authoritative. With the Old Testament, acceptance of their writings as being part of the Hebrew Scriptures was almost immediate as God's chosen one was clearly identified in and among his people. And of course, when Jesus... In the New Testament, quote scripture, he's quoting from the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament. So he is clearly accepting and validating those writings as God's word. And as far as the New Testament is concerned, the process of recognizing and, collect, and the collection of the various books took place in the first centuries of the early church. Very early on, the New Testament books were being recognized as Scripture. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 5.18, Paul quotes the Old Testament, and he also quotes Luke, and he calls them both Scripture. In 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter recognizes Paul's writing as Scripture. And of course, Paul's letters were circulated around the churches in Asia Minor and Greece, and they were accepted by those churches as being the authoritative word of God. So early church fathers, New Testament writers, and early historians, and the local church communities all came to a general consensus early on as to what should be included and excluded from the canon. I had another weak analogy I want to give you, but uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that one. And I would just want to go on to the third point. So we have the authoritative authors, we have the acceptance by God's people, and we have content. And there are several things in here regarding content that, that are important for us to know. Something came to be recognized as authoritative part of Scripture in part because it was historically accurate. You know, did those writings reflect and record actual facts? Was it truthful? The second thing under content is that it was consistent in doctrine. Did the teachings harmonize with other teachings of known scripture? And the third thing is one that I don't think we should overlook, but I think often does. But we have every reason to believe that books from God would contain within themselves evidence of their divine origin. And the reform reformers, people like John Calvin and Martin Luther, refer to these divine qualities or indicators as divine indicators. So the third thing under content is the divine indicators. And what that means is, if God is genuinely the one who stands behind these books, then we would expect these books to share God's own qualities. After all, we know that the created world is from God by seeing God's own attributes all throughout creation. 
Even Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. God's divine fingerprints are all over creation. They're in our human cell. They're all throughout the solar system. And when we look at creation, we can't help but notice that there is a divine creator mind behind it. So likewise, we would expect God's special revelation, his written word, to do the same. If it's in creation, it's going to be in his word. And examples of such qualities of God's word, of that in God's word, would be things like beauty and excellence. Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Other qualities would be power and efficacy. Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word is powerful. Other part of God's fingerprints that are in his word is the unity and the harmony that can be found in scripture. Hebrews 6.12 says, God did this so that by, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled to take hold of the hope set before us that we may be greatly encouraged. There is unity and harmony in what he gave us in his book. Now certainly there are are other books and other writings that have beauty and, and efficacy and harmony in them. But the divine authorship is confirmed by the internal testimony of his Holy Spirit. Through these divine qualities, Christians recognize the voice of their Lord in the scriptures. As Jesus himself said, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. So there, there is in content, historical accuracy, there's consistent doctrine, and there are divine indicators. And there's one other point I want to make regarding content, um, and it's that there are reliable texts which indicate a divine preservation of his words over, over and throughout history. What we have is true and accurate to what was originally written. It hasn't been changed like Muslims and other skeptics claim. And if you take, for example, a comparison to other ancient writings, the Bible stands far and above all of them. The works of Plato we have only 210 manuscripts of his writings. And they're written 1,200 years after the fact. Caesar's Gallic Wars, only 251 manuscripts. And those copies are from 900 years after the event. Homer's Iliad, there are 1,700 copies of his work. The earliest one is 400 years after the event. And nobody doubts the authenticity of what we have in comparison to what actually happened um, by those authors, or what was written by those authors. But they have so few manuscripts and such a large period of time in between the events, yet we still trust them. But the Bible has over 25,000 manuscripts. And some people would say that it's up to 66,000 manuscripts if you take even just small fragments of scripture that has been found. And those manuscripts can date 
as early as 25 to 150 years after the events in which they were uh, written about. So that's not necessarily an argument in terms of, of why they came in to be scripture, but the preponderance of evidence of, of the authenticity and the accuracy of these writings only serves to give us confidence that what we have is true and faithful to what was written at the time. So let me make a note right here about the Apocrypha and why it is not included in our canon of Scripture. And there are four things. Uh, one, most of the Apocryphal books do not claim for themselves the same authority as other New T Old Testament books. For example, First and Second Maccabees, uh, several times in, in those books, uh, they reference to a time when there were prophets that spoke from God who would tell them what to do. But they were not living at such a time when that was being written. So the, the book itself doesn't claim to be authoritative. Second thing regarding the Apocrypha is that they were not regarded as God's word by Jewish people. The people closest to that time took them as good and interesting and historical writings. Uh, but they did not see them as God's words even at the time that they had them in front of them. They were also not considered as scripture by Jesus and other New Testament authors. You can't find them being quoted at all by anybody in the early church or by Jesus himself. And they also, and this is probably the most important thing, is that the apocryphal books contain teaching that is inconsistent with the rest of the Bible. They include things like prayers for the dead and justification by faith plus works and not faith alone. Now, I would encourage anybody to go read them. They're very, they're, they're very interesting and intriguing works of literature. And, and in many cases, they fill in the gap between the Old and the New Testament. Uh, but they are not God's word. So why don't we wrap all this stuff up together? So if we have books that we know come from authoritative authors, books that were accepted by God's people, books that have content that is accurate and consistent doctrinally, and a book that has God's fingerprints all over it, then there are some conclusions that we need to make. The books of the Bible were divinely inspired and authoritative the moment they were written. And at various points in history, they, there was human recognition of these writings. And like I said, normally this was immediate as the people recognized the writers themselves as being spokesmen for God. But ultimately... And finally, these recognized books were collected into what we know as the Bible. And that is what you see before you, you here today. So what is the application point? What do we need to take away from this? What difference does it make? First of all, we need to have confidence that we are truly reading God's word. Second, we need to be careful not to pick and choose what we believe from the Bible. Likewise, we need to be careful not to allow other writings, even, even from good Christian authors, to be elevated to a point where they're equal with the Bible so that we listen to them and not Scripture itself. And ultimately, if these are indeed the words of God. And you can see from the, prophet, uh, the process and the evidence that they are. Then we are truly obligated to obey them. You know, there was a, another Babylon Bee, another satirical article that said, Scholars confirm, do not be anxious 
does not apply in a global pandemic. You know, I think sometimes, you know, we take certain things in Scripture and we apply them. And like, yeah, God tells us not to be anxious, but I don't know, this situation here is harder. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm justified in ignoring what God says here. I'm just going to kind of do my own thing. But if these are God's words, we need to obey them and put them into practice at all times. You know, we here at EBC, we talk about honoring God and loving people. I think sometimes we don't like something as simple as that because deep down, we know what love requires of us. And it's not something that is often easy or natural or, or what we would want to do. But we have God's word. They are truly his word, and we can trust that. And that being the case, we need to allow it to affect our lives and impact our lives and, and change us to obey what is written here. So why don't you pray with me as we wrap it up. Our Heavenly Father, God, I confess that this was a whirlwind tour of looking at the canon of Scripture. But I do pray that as we, as your people, take the time to look at and understand how and why we got this book that you have given us that has been so well preserved over thousands of years, God, we, may we have a confidence and hearing you through these pages. Allowing your words to penetrate our hearts and our minds uh, so that we as your children uh, can live the way that you want us to live. Uh, God, thank you that you have given us your word, that you have not left us hanging to go look for your truth and your revelation elsewhere, but that you've given it to us. What a privilege that is. So we, we love you and we praise you and we thank you all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Let me take a moment right now to encourage you as we wrap this time up, come together now in your care groups and discuss some of the questions uh, that I've given you. Hopefully you have those two downloaded and printed off. Um, and I really do think it's important that we discuss them as a church body um, because uh, picking and choosing something because it's inconvenient or politically incorrect uh, is just not something that we as a church can do. You know, there are churches here in the Miami Valley, mainline Protestant churches, where the pastors do not believe that we should hold to the teaching of the Bible. There are pastors who reject certain parts of it because it doesn't fit with their politically correct or their common modern understanding of how we should live. And that's just wrong. And so we need to talk about these things. So I, I've given you six questions to talk about in your care groups. You probably won't have time to do them all, um, I'd encourage you maybe at least do one, two, and five if you can. Um, and then the rest, take, them take some time just to mull them over throughout this week. Um, you know, look at why do you believe the Bible? Why is it important to know um, which writings are God's words or not? Discuss those and wrestle through them if you have to. Um, it's important to do the hard work of thinking through the ramifications of whether or not we accept this book as God's word. And it's important to do it now uh, rather than when things get rough. Or don't. So uh, do that. And then as a care group, pray for one another. Pray that we would have uh, the faith and the wisdom to take his book and apply it to our life.